Good morning. We, uh, we live in a world that's uh, full of problems. And uh, before we get to the text, let's pray. Let's pray together about the state of just a number of things uh, that are going on uh, globally and in our country. And uh, let's just continually be a people that cry out to the Lord, and let's do that together before we dive in. God, we uh, come to you with continual sense of just uh, burden about the situation in Afghanistan. It's of particular interest to us here as we just have been involved with that country in a military way over the last uh, 20 years and just seeing the responsibility of that place we feel as Americans, but also, Lord, just knowing the things that are going on in the name of religion are just gut-wrenching and and, uh, we just are broken about what's happening to believers, what's happening to women and children and and, uh, people who are innocent. God, we just cry out to you that uh, you would somehow bring about um, a great boldness for the believers in that place. We pray that you would somehow use the testimony of their faithfulness in the midst of death. Would you use that to bring about a great change? Not just in that country, but throughout the globe. We pray for for your name to somehow go forth. We know and trust that you are sovereign We know that you're in control and you take uh, dreadful, awful evil and turn it into something that can still accomplish your purpose. And so we just continue to ask that you do that. We pray for our land, Lord, as we have flooding and destruction to our east and we have fires to the west and all of that, Lord, there is tremendous loss and tremendous uh, hardship I pray that you would raise up the church in these places and continue to convict us and lead us and how we can respond and how we can be a part of meeting tangible needs, but also how we can be a part of communicating your love and your presence in the midst of these uh, just difficult days. God, we as a church, we need your guidance and your great wisdom. We know that we've been armed with the gospel And would you continue to call us to spreading the truth of your character and exhibiting the the greatness of your love and grace. Help us to be uh, just good representatives of your name. And God, as we turn to your word, would you guide us and encourage us and spur us on? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in a series called Following Jesus, which is a brand new concept for all of us. We've never been following Jesus before at this church. There it is. Uh, We just want to be refreshed in the basics of who we're following. We want to look at a couple of key moments in the life of Jesus and see what he's doing in those moments as he's confronted with certain things, as he's challenged in certain things, and as he's just going through the normalcy of, of day-to-day life, he is, he is teaching us and he is modeling us a certain way of life and a certain way of living. And that's what we're interested in as, as his followers. We are interested in, in picking up on his character and the way he lived his life. And so we've been saying that we're a group of committed followers of Jesus on a journey with him. And what we are doing is we're wanting to see what's important to Jesus and we want to see how he leads us in the critical moments of life and in the boring moments of life. In all of that, he is, he is guiding us into a deeper walk with him, into a relationship where we're closer to him and we're following him more precisely and, and authentically. Uh, and we're, we're going to see uh, over the course of the next couple of weeks the various things that he's calling us to. Last week we talked about how he's calling us into an understanding of the image of God. That he takes a question about taxes uh, that's meant to trap him and he turns it into a moment where he instructs his children, his people, about who they are. And he instructs the whole crowd about who they are. That's important for Jesus. He'll take whatever moment he can to... to to direct us back to understanding what a human is because of 
once we get that right, it affects so much of the rest of our lives. And so as you follow Jesus, you'll be nurtured in the image of God and understanding that and, and realizing the implications of that. This week we want to talk about God's grace. God is gracious. And Jesus spends a lot of time talking about that. And many moments, <clears throat> excuse me, many moments in his life and ministry, he took people back to this understanding of God's grace. So we could have gone to many different texts. You could flip through the Gospels and you just see almost on every page there's some sort of directive about God's grace. It is a core issue that we have going on. A core issue in our lives is handling sin and what to do with it and how God thinks about it and how he handles it is a core issue. Much of the things that we're wrestling with are actually symptoms of this core issue. And so Jesus takes us back to God's grace. We're gonna look at Luke 15. If you have your Bibles, you can open there. We're gonna look specifically at the parable called the prodigal son. It's actually a story of, that Jesus made up. It's not an actual story. A parable is a made up story uh, that Jesus made up about two sons. And we wanna look at both of those. What we'll see um, in this is, is this main point. As we follow Jesus, he will nurture our understanding of God's grace. As you follow Jesus, as I follow Jesus, he will nurture our understanding of grace. And uh, we feel that that's really important as we live in an age of uh, strife, as we are constantly bombarded with conflict. Uh, God's grace is an important foundation to how we relate with him, but also how we relate with other people. So let's see how Jesus handles this. Before we actually get in the parable, I want to set the context because this parable sits within this context that begins in chapter 15, verse 1. So if you have your Bibles, we'll start in verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And so we have this problem between Jesus and the Pharisees and scribes. There's all these tax collectors who are thieves and, and they're really corrupt and all sorts of mess we don't really need to get into right now, but he's receiving these people and eating with them and they're, and they're coming to him, asking for instruction and, and, and uh, changing their ways. And you can see several of those stories in scripture. There's a woman who comes and bathes his feet, washes his feet with her tears in this expensive perfume. And he goes to Zacchaeus who pledges to, to pay back everybody more than what he, what he uh, took. And there's these incredible stories of redemption happening. And these Pharisees and scribes, the religious leaders of the day, have a big problem with what Jesus is doing. And we need to be uh, careful here because it's not like Jesus is, is uh, just hanging out with whoever. He's, he's uh, noticing a certain kind of repentance and a certain group who's repenting who you wouldn't normally expect. And that's what we see Jesus uh, doing. That's who we see him hanging out with and the and they have this problem and they're grumbling and so Jesus addresses this problem with a few parables. He doesn't just turn to them and say, stop your complaining and grumbling. No, he tells them three parables and we'll look at the last one. And I want us to watch how Jesus handles this moment. The first two parables are very simple, they're short and they talk about how there's joy in heaven about repentance. And then we come to this third parable which communicates a similar thing, but Jesus goes into much more depth. So verse 11, and Jesus said there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. And so he went out and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. That's the first scene. This, this story has three scenes. That's the first one. And it's fairly typical. Everybody listening to the parable at this point would say this is all going according to what we have normally seen in, in our human existence there's this younger son who decides he wishes his dad were dead. That's the idea here. He wants the property or he wants his share of the estate. 
Legally speaking in this time, the younger son who asked for it gets a third and the older son gets two thirds. And so he's saying, dad, I want a third of my uh, share of the estate. Now it's not like there's 401ks, 503bs, 20 billion eights, whatever the numbers are. It's not like you can just go to the bank, withdraw all the money or get to the trust fund, that sort of thing. His possessions are in animals and property. And so it's not just like he hands the inheritance over. It is a process where he has to publicly, to the rest of the village, go and sell the goats and the cows and the chickens and and sell certain aspects of his land so that he can convert it into cash to give to his son. And so he has to deal with this fact, that dad has to deal with this fact that his son is rejecting him, which would bring shame upon him and his whole family. He has this disobedient son. The whole village knows it and is now looking down at him. What, What is going on with that family? Can you believe that son? He is... He is a loser, and look at all this, and what's happening to that family, oh my goodness, and there's all this shame happening, and the dad has to walk through that by selling all of his stuff to everybody. I share that to just so we know the depth of what's going on here. It's not just kind of what we'd think in the 21st century of a kid just kind of quietly walks away from his home. It is a public rejection, wishing his dad was dead. Not caring about the rest of the village, not caring about his family, totally rejecting his upbringing. And so he gets a third of the inheritance, which is foolish even now for, for him to ask for that. Why not wait till his dad is dead? And then he gets even more, you know, as, as he gets older to be more inheritance. But he asks now. He's clearly foolish. And like a typical teenager, he squanders it. That's what the crowd is thinking. Typical teenagers thinking they know everything. They'll go out in the world and they squander it. Wait till a famine comes. Then what's going to happen? So the crowd's doing that. They, they understand this is part of what happens. This is why you don't reject, or this is why you don't uh, ask for the inheritance too soon, because it's a mess. And so everybody would, in this story is, is just like us right now. Boy, teenagers, they really act foolishly. They really squander stuff. They don't really know what's going on in the real world. Stinking millennials. Baby boomers would never have done this when they were teenagers. <laughs> This kid thinks he knows everything and it turns out he doesn't. He squanders it and then a famine comes and he's got no backup plan. And so he's there in Gentile country. So he has taken the inheritance of God in the land that God provided when they entered the promised land. He has squandered the very provision of God in a place outside of the promised land and now he has to work and submit himself to a Gentile. And not only does he have to do that as a pig farmer, and not only does he have to do that, he has to beg for pig food. I've never eaten pig food. I've never really seen a pig farm. I'm told it's disgusting. That's all I need. I believe it. It's terrible. This is a really bad situation. And the crowd... And Jesus' day would see this as absolutely fitting. He got what he deserved. So that's scene one. Scene two, verses 17 through 24. When he came to himself, it's, a, it's an idiom for just coming to your senses. It's amazing that that phrase even exists in the English language. There's so much of this uh, happening in life where we like wake up that even in the first century they had an idiom for that. Just like we do today. So when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. And again, up to this point, this is all typical. It's at this point that Jesus becomes controversial and he becomes very surprising in his storytelling. But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and felt compassion and he ran and embraced him and he kissed him and the idea is there that he continually just hangs his arm on his son's repeatedly kissing him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe, put it on him. 
Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. And so this young kid comes to his senses and he realizes, what am I doing? This is terrible. I gotta go back and repent. I gotta return. At least I can just exist in my father's household. Even if I, I don't even need to be called a son, let me just exist there. It's much better than this situation. I've done so much wrong. Let me just go back and try to make some right so that I can survive. And so that's all normal cultural practice in the sense that that's what would happen. The son would squander it just like wisdom tells us would happen. And he comes crying back to the father. Now, normal cultural practice, but the father would, there would be some sort of long, drawn-out process for the son to be reinstated. The father wouldn't even approach the son. The son would have to humbly come and go through whatever he had to go through. There's all kinds of practices that could be happening, but the bottom line is there'd be this huge process of restoration to, first of all, make sure the son was repentant, and second of all, to, so that the father could protect the family from further damage of the son. And show that he's handling this righteously and, and, and had already disowned the son. He wants to prove that he's distanced himself from that kind of disobedience. And so there's all sorts of cultural things that could have happened, but that's not what happens in the story of Jesus. The father would not even wait for the son's speech. He runs. And before the son can even say anything, he's just embracing him and and. And then the son starts to talk, and and even at the first sign of repentance, the father stops him from completing the speech. It's a sentence too short from what he had been practicing. Yells at his servants. And they kill the fattened calf. So much going on here culturally. Um, It could be that the, 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 the dad is running because he wants to protect his son from harm from other villagers. As this guy has disowned, not just his family, but probably the whole village, there's resentment there. So he could just be running there. Um, Jewish fathers in this day and age don't run. It's not like they had just put on, lace up your sneakers and put on your shorts and go for a run. It was quite a bit of work to run, and then you've got to work up a sweat, and who knows when your next bath is and how you dirty your clothes and all sorts of inconveniences there, but then also just the fact that you just don't run because that's disrespectful. It, it, It's actually dishonoring to be in a hurry. So there's all kinds of cultural things going on here, and yet this dad doesn't care about any of that. He takes on all of that to go receive his son. And the first sign of repentance, he throws a party. A fattened calf is not just for him and his son and a few buddies. A fattened calf feeds a lot of people. It was specifically reserved actually for religious purposes, but the dad doesn't even care. It's like, let's get that thing in here. Let's throw this huge party. Probably the whole village is invited to demonstrate the restoration. Puts a ring on his finger. That's uh, what they would use to do official business. If if you write up something and you seal an envelope, you put your ring on it, that's the family seal. It's equivalent today maybe to the credit card. The dad gives him the credit card right away so he can go back to doing business in his father's name. Put shoes on his feet. He was in such a desperate situation, he didn't have shoes. Put the best robe on him. I can't imagine what he smelled like. Can't imagine what condition he was in. Totally and fully restored him. The father has great compassion. It's important here, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, the son does indeed repent, and that's part of the acceptance. It's not that Jesus is just giving approval for whatever he did, but the the point is that the son is fully restored. And we are this son. We have taken our inheritance of being created in the image of God and we have squandered it. We have taken our image bearing identity and spent it pursuing worthless things. And the first sign of repentance, the father receives the son back. And you would expect it the story to stop at this point. Oftentimes, this is what we know about the parable, is this moment. But Jesus keeps going, and it gets even better. Because there's still another son. Remember, the story started out with a man who had two sons. We've talked about the younger one. What about the older one? Verse 25, scene three. Now the older son was in the field. 
And as he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked him what these things meant. And the servant said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. And his father came out and entreated him. Different circumstances, but we see the father doing the same thing. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you, I've never disobeyed your command. There's a lie. What kid has never disobeyed their dad? I never even got time out once. You never had to, no, 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 no. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. You never even threw me so much as a birthday party. All these years I never even had a party. And now this son of yours who's devoured your property with prostitutes, you kill a fattened calf for him? That's reserved for worship to the, to the Lord of the universe. Because he just comes home all of a sudden and he's going to do all this? I ain't going in there. This is bogus. So the father says to him, son, I love that he calls him son there. You are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this brother, this your brother. He's not just my son, he's your brother. He was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. You would expect this story to stop but it doesn't. There's one more scene, and Jesus uh, leaves it open-ended. We don't get the full end of the story. When we read this, it doesn't feel like the end. The first part with the younger son feels like a, man, there's some resolve here, but we're left open-ended, and I think that's because Jesus wants us to keep thinking. What happened with the older son? Did he actually go back in? Did he repent? How did that work out, and, and what was the relationship going on? And the point of that is so that we think about it. Parables speak to our hearts. That's what Jesus is trying to do. And there is a heart within us that has a hard time with God's grace. And Jesus wants us to enter into that wrestle and see, are we like this older son? Not only are we like this younger son, but are we also like this older son? And as he's telling the stories, you can see he's thinking to the Pharisees and, and the scribes who are there, having a hard time with Jesus, showing acceptance of these sinners who are coming to repentance. And so you see that this son is angry and jealous. He's saying, it's not fair. What a classic sibling response. It's not fair. You can see the self-righteousness. And yet the father is gracious and kind to him. And so here's the point of the story that Jesus is trying to say. The father is gracious and he forgives. Amen? Amen? That's what we see. What what we're supposed to understand here in this story is that Jesus is telling us about who God is and and what God is in his character. And what we see here as as we see this story play out is that God is gracious and he forgives. Forgiveness is an aspect of his overall graciousness. Graciousness is unmerited favor bestowed upon someone. The way that works out is that he forgives you even though you don't deserve it. You have squandered. You have done nothing to repay. You are in so low of a situation you could not get yourself out of it. No matter what you've done, it doesn't matter what you try, you keep on making messes. You keep on going further and further down, descending deeper and deeper into darkness. You can't get yourself out and the Father graciously forgives you and restores you. And not only that, But notice the emotion that Jesus gives the Father. You can feel it. And he's trying to help us see that God isn't just a God who's gracious, but he does this joyfully. And that's the point of the parables that come before this. Verse 7, just so I tell you there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Verse 10, just so I tell you there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then we get this story where there's this huge celebration by just the son repenting and he does this whole marvelous thing. The point is, is that not only that God is gracious and forgiving, but he's joyful and ready to do it. 
It's almost like he's scanning the horizon, waiting for the sun to come home and can't wait to run out and, and embrace him. God is ready and joyful to forgive. He removes us of our shame. And you could even argue here that as, as the dad is running, he's taking on the shame of the whole situation upon himself. He will be ashamed so that he can receive this sinner. What a marvelous God we serve, amen? He is ready and joyful to forgive you. God is looking and he's willing. So as we spend time with God, as we, as we pick up on his character, what we'll see as we follow Jesus is that he will nurture our understanding of that. He will seek to teach you about who God is. Specifically, that he is ready and willing to forgive. He is so gracious and happy to be gracious. But Jesus also wants to teach us about our response to God's graciousness because that's where the rubber meets the road. Jesus here is not just announcing God is gracious, but he's dealing with two responses. And that's where the meat and potatoes of this parable are. So just two points here. As we think about application, first of all, as we think God is gracious, or as we understand God to be gracious, we have to receive it. This is son number one. We are in this situation. We have trashed the inheritance and sin. The son really blew it here, didn't he? And so have we. So have we. Now this involves repentance. There's always generalizations made about Jesus. Ah, oh, he just hung out at bars and, and you know, all this sort of stuff uh, made about Jesus. He's not just hanging out in bars and clubs or uh, Las Vegas or even Las Sendas. What's going on here is that Jesus is responding to repentance. And that's what's important to see. He's not just giving approval for whatever lifestyle. But what's happening here is people are coming to him with repentance and he welcomes that. And so that's what's important that as we receive God's grace, uh, what we need to do is in order to receive that, we repent, which is simply we change directions. We were going this way, we've recognized the wrongness of that, and we go this way. I think a hard time, one of the difficulties we have of receiving God's grace is because we, we don't go through the proper just routine, really, of repentance, which is simply a wake-up call. You come to your senses, pff, whoa, what am I doing? You agree that what you're doing is wrong. When's the last time you told the Lord, man, that was wrong that I was doing that? God, I agree with you that that was wrong. It was against your character. It was destructive as against your will. That's a key part of repentance. I'm going this way. Whoa, this is wrong. That's what confession is. It's an agreement. Then we just ask God to forgive us. And notice the son here. He's not even expecting full restoration. What he's just pleading for, for forgiveness. Don't even, I'm not even worthy to be called a son anymore. I understand what I've done is totally wrong. Just let me come back into your house. Just forgive me just so I can come back in your house. And that's a key part of repentance as well is asking for the forgiveness and then receiving it. When's the last time you simply just asked God to forgive you and sat in that for just 30 seconds and listened for his voice? I just invite you to receive God's forgiveness. The son wasn't ready to do it until he'd worked on a pig farm. Finally slowed down long enough. Finally spent enough time in need to recognize his real need for God. You see, we can't just sit back and wait for God to rescue us out of the pig field. We have to repent. And that's what he's looking for. He's looking for that repentance. Repentance. A couple of things in, in my life that have prevented me from receiving God's grace in full. So I just wanted to share these with you. 
And I, I see them in the text. I'm careful when I read parables not to draw too much. We can kind of over-psychologize the characters. The, the overall point here is to receive God's grace. What I've noticed in my life is that I don't receive God's grace oftentimes, number one, because I have a faulty view of God. I don't actually agree that he's gracious. I think he is demanding. I think he's angry and distant and hard to please. I think my sin has disappointed him, and I, I think it's, it's really impossible for me to get over that disappointment from God. He, I'm just going to... He's just going to be disappointed in me. So I'm stuck in that. I'm not going to receive God's forgiveness. I'm not even willing to even hear it. When finally he wakes me up out of that, man, it's amazing the flood of grace that I newly experienced and breaks through the, the jam that was in my relationship with the Lord. Second, uh, in my life I've just seen, I won't receive God's grace if I have a lack of repentance. If I'm waiting for God to initiate, if I'm uh, not really agreeing with the wrongdoing, uh, then I will, will not really receive God's grace because I'm not actually wanting it. I'm, hate, I'm hating consequences. I'm not hating my sin. And so the, the, the younger son here was not just expecting God to pull him out of the field. God, if you just give me some food today, then I'll, I'll leave this and I'll go start living how I'm supposed to be living. There's none of that. It was just, what am I doing? Let me go back. Let me go right some wrongs. So there's a lack of repentance that sometimes prevents us. And then third, there's just foolishness. I don't know how else to describe just my general foolishness in life. When I'm acting foolishly, I'm not even listening to the Lord, so I'm not gonna receive grace from him. Because I'm not even paying attention. I'm just going my way and squandering. So I just encourage you today. Um, the Father is gracious and he forgives you. And he's ready and willing to forgive you. And I would just want you to open up your heart truly to admit the wrongdoing. Come to your senses. And receive his great grace. There is nothing like it. There's still another son. Oh, I, we don't have time for these. Hold on, we'll, we'll read John 1, 11 through 12. This is all just Jesus talking about repentance. He came to his own. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus came to his own. His own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his in name, he gave the right to become children of God. In other words, God's after Repentance. And belief in him. That's what Jesus is teaching here. Repent and watch God respond. Second, second application is to give grace. So receive grace, give grace. This is son number two. We are this son. We have resisted the grace of God towards others. It has angered us. It has frustrated us. It has caused all kinds of walls to come up. And I think this is really important as we live in an age full of relational strife. The older son had spent a lot of time in the father's household. He spent a lot of time in close proximity to the father, doing things for the father, but never actually picked up on his character. We can spend a lot of times in close proximity to God doing things religious things, godly things, checking things off the list because we know this is what good Christians do. We can spend a lot of time working for God, but have we actually, ever actually entered into a close relationship with him where we're receiving forgiveness from him, admitting wrongdoing rather than covering it up? I think, uh, again, we've taken forgiveness out of the confession or out of the apology, even amongst each other. We just say, I'm sorry, oh, it's okay. Let me express how I feel about it by saying I'm sorry, and then we say, no, 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 it's okay. And, and there's no admittance of wrongdoing, there's no agreement that was wrong, and then there's no transaction of forgiveness. And yet Jesus, in his, in his prayer that he taught us, uh, a key line of something we're daily supposed to pray. It's even in a couple chapters before in Luke 11. Forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. 
In other words, forgiveness is a daily thing, and our experience of God's forgiveness is somewhat dependent upon our experience of forgiveness with each other. And if we're having a hard time receiving forgiveness from God, we're going to have a hard time receiving and giving forgiveness from other people. If we're having a hard time giving and receiving forgiveness from other people, there's a heart issue there that's going to make it hard for you to receive forgiveness from God. Because we've, we've focused on right and wrong and keeping score. We've allowed bitterness to develop. And that's what we see in son number two. Uh, forgiveness, there's, there's a number of ways probably to define it and understand it. Let me just give this simple definition. Alan gave this uh, about a year ago when we were going through the Lord's Prayer and talking about that line. He said, it's choosing to endure hurt and not hold malice to make things right. Forgiveness is choosing to endure hurt and not hold malice in order to make things right. Nothing says you have to forget. But forgiveness is what we're called to, and it doesn't have to happen immediately. This is why son number two exists, and we don't know what kind of process there is, but I like to think there is a process where the older son finally realized, man, I, I gotta forgive my brother because he's here. He's fully restored. And I can sit here and be bitter about it, or I can sit here and forgive him. There's a number of things in my life that prevent the giving of grace and forgiveness. Uh, as I thought about this, as I thought about the older brother in my own life, this is what I've seen, four things. Um, self-righteousness or self-justification often prevents me from extending grace to other people because I've focused on, here's what I've done that's right. And I may have done a little bit of wrong, but that's understandable given the whole circumstance. So I will paint the circumstance to be pro-me. You ever do that? I'm not giving grace there. What I'm trying to do is prove why I'm right. My wife is wrong. Or my kids are wrong. Or my friend. No, no, no. You don't understand. Let me show you my perspective and make sure that you come to my perspective. That is gonna prevent me from extending grace because I'm wanting people to understand me and it's self-focused and prideful and the root of it is actually insecurity because deep down inside, I'm, I, don't, I know I don't measure up. I know that I'm, I'm inadequate and so let me compare myself to another situation or let me try to paint it in a positive light so that I do measure up and then deserve some sort of treatment. And that's what the older son is doing. Look at all I've done, Dad. Look at all this. I've done all this work for you and and you don't give me anything as if that was the point of the relationship to obey and get transactional blessing. That's not the point of a relationship because that's not a relationship. So self-righteousness often prevents me uh, from giving grace and often leads to just venting. And so uh, be careful of that in our age of strife. Second thing, uh, let me just move real quickly through these last three things. I have an overriding passion for something other than God's grace. I care about justice or serving or control, and I lose balance in the character of God. God is able to be just and gracious at the same time. And we have to grow more and more in that balance as we spend time with Jesus. Third, just a lack of relationship with God, I'm spending the wrong kind of time with God. Activity and closeness in proximity to God do not equal knowing God. I turn God into a scorekeeper and miss the joy of a deep relationship with him that's really found in repentance and receiving forgiveness from him. Fourth, I have anger towards God or I disagree with something that he's doing. That's the son's big issue here. Dad, you have no idea what you're doing. How many times have I said that to God? And that has led, not towards health in my life, that has led towards more destruction and strife. So God is gracious and ready to forgive. He is absolutely compassionate towards you and I, amen? He is an incredible being. And Jesus cares that we see this and he will nurture our understanding of that and he will nurture us along in our response of Uh, to that grace because it's so foreign to this sinful world. 
And he cares to develop our gracious response. And this is who we're following. And this is what I think Jesus is leading us into in the next few years. This is why we're talking about this. We want to be a church that grows in our understanding of God's grace. We want to be a church that seeks to experience God's grace in deeper ways through confession and repentance and turning around towards him. And we want to be a church that longs to give grace to those around us. Amen. We're going to close in a time of worship and communion um, and then uh, Dave Lindstrom is going to lead us in communion. And then after a few songs, Preston will lead us in a special time of prayer for our student ministry, Pastor Ryan Burchette. Let's pray. God, thanks uh, for your forgiveness. And we uh, turn to you. And we can only praise you. You have brought us out of incredible darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of light. Thank you. We praise you. You get all the glory. And so we turn to your praise Continue to speak to us about our hearts. If there's anyone here, Lord, that uh, is just wanting to just earn their forgiveness, Lord, break them of that and help them see that you truly just forgive to those who are seeking it. Speak to our hearts, Lord, continually. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.